All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Yeah, Sean? Okay, so we're really excited about this presentation and discussion today. Thank you all for coming. It's great to see so many of you here from the WMS community. I think we have a good mix of, um, you know, both families, board members, faculty, and staff. So, you know, really the whole community here to, to listen to Sean's talk. Um, I'm gonna get started. My name is Lorraine Ng. I'm the Director of Development at WMS. Um, it's a great pleasure to have you guys here for our virtual version of the Community Education Workshop Series. Um, at WMS, we provide community education to be able to share resources and knowledge about how to better support our children and families, um, both inside and out, outside of the home. Um, so just want to introduce Sean, Sean Kramer. He is a WMS parent uh, with a student in our early childhood program. Uh, he is an education consultant and instruction designer. He's here today to talk about brain health and education and answer your questions about brain development. Um, Sean has a master's degree in mind, brain, and education from Harvard University and a bachelor's degree in biological basis of behavior from the University of Pennsylvania. He gave a similar talk at WMS last year, and um, it was just a really engaging, informative talk, and we're thrilled he's returning to speak again on this topic, and um, he'll have an added emphasis on health and learning during this time of quarantine. Um, so let just want to let you guys know we're, we'll be recording this session, um, and at the end we'll be taking questions, so I will, we, Sean has a form to, to pose those questions at the end, and he'll share that soon. So without further ado, Sean, I will turn it over to you. Thanks, Lorene. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. Um, I see the numbers here. That's that's quite a lot of people on a Zoom call around dinner time. So thanks for thanks for joining. Um, and I'll try and honor your time and your uh, nightly routines by going uh, according to schedule here. Um, like Lorene said, I gave a similar talk last year. Uh, so hopefully it's not too repetitive if you were there. Um, I tried to throw in a few new things, especially considering what this last year has been like. Um, I, I changed the date on some of these slides uh, that, I, that I brought over, and it was January 20th of last year, which is right before the tidal wave of, of everything hitting um, happened. So it was all in person. I could see raised hands and read the room a bit. Obviously very different here, but I'll try and go through. Um, so I'll get through. Um, Lorene gave a very kind introduction. Um, uh, this is me. I have a background in, in cognitive neuroscience, and my, my work is focused on applying that to education program development. So I've done that at some publishers. I've done that through some course development work. Um, and now I'm part of a group that runs a startup uh, that is focusing on technology and, and kids, giving kids agency and tools to kind of write their own stories. So we're using storytelling as a, as a way for kids to kind of develop a, a sense of identity and independence. Um, and I am also a second year parent at Woodenville Montessori. And uh, here's my family. There's my wife, Jenny. Uh, Daniel's in my arms there. He's in the pine classroom with Carol and Aurelia. As a second year there, he's, he's just taken off. It's super cool to see. Um, he was a half day last year and a full day this year. And it's, uh, it's awesome. Masks and all, he's, he's still, uh, he's loving being in person there. And then there's little Ellie. She's gonna join the toddler program next year. So we're really stoked about that. Um, this is the part where you make sure you got on the right flight. This is what we're going to talk about uh, is the brain. Uh, I want to cover some brain basics because um, without those, I think some of the other stuff doesn't really make sense. I want to talk a little bit about how the brain works um, just from the premise of, of not maybe uh, maybe some of you on the call don't, don't know a lot about how that works. Um, I'm happy to answer questions there. I'm also not a neuroscientist or a neurologist, so I, I have a very different application of brain learning. And... Uh, so I, you know, I don't go super in depth into any of these things, but again, my focus is on application, especially for education. I'll, I'll address some common myths, especially as it pertains to learning. Um, you may have heard of some of these and uh, I'm happy to answer questions there too. And then kind of the recommendations piece of, of how we learn, um, or maybe not recommendations, but a little bit of, of uh, application focus on how we learn, what do we know about the brain? How does that instruct what we do uh, for learning programs? And then an extra focus on what does it take to have healthy brains this year? Uh, I guess all years, but especially this year. Uh, and then some time for questions. I'll try out this little thing where I put a link there. You can add your questions. If it goes off the rails, you can just go off mute and ask questions. That's fine, but we'll try that. Um, and I will keep going. All right. 
interrupt me too if I if if I you know you can't hear me or you want to clarify something that is that is fine. Okay, so some brain basics. The first thing, the the very first thing that you have to know about the brain is that a lot of it's still a mystery. It's not like this thing that we know everything about, and you know we can kind of use that knowledge and, and distribute it everywhere. It's it's very much a black box, and so despite tons of research there and tons of dollars going into that research and tons of very, very intelligent people going after it, um, we still don't know a lot. Um, and that's important to understand because it should give us a sense of kind of humility when we talk about this. Uh, we, you know, here's our best guess or here's what we think. Um, and also be very wary of statements or claims that claim to base something off of brain knowledge. So if the brain works this way, here's a study that says this, therefore we should definitely do this. Um, your instinct, like mine should, mine is, should always be to say, well, okay, let's hold on there. This, there's a lot that we still don't know about the brain. Uh, the Allen Institute for Brain Sciences is uh, nearby in Seattle, about 10, 15 miles away from the school. And uh, about a year and a half ago, two years ago, they published this blog post that said, what we still don't know about the brain or something like five unsolved mysteries. And it was some pretty basic stuff, like what is the brain made of? <laughs> and I mean, we know we know that there's there's neurons in there, but classifying those cells, there's just this world that we don't know. So, like the posture of any scientist, it should be we don't know, and then trying to add knowledge to that. Uh, but unfortunately, because it's such a black box, it's leveraged kind of weird in the world. Like you'll see brain-based interventions here, or this is a brain-based software. Um, again, red flag should kind of go up for you if you if you see those things. How we do know about the brain comes through uh, different methods of research and different imaging studies. Uh, the most basic research method um, through the ages is uh, what's called a lesion study, which is basically incapacitating a part of the brain and seeing what happens. So it's kind of like algebra where you solve for a variable and then you can see what else happens through the other variables. It's, it's kind of like that. If you take out a part of the brain, it was through, you know, usually it was by accident, um, then you can you see what happens uh, to the behavior. Uh, the most famous example of this is Phineas Gage. He was a, a railroad worker and hit a spike a certain way. You can tell I don't work on the railroad. I, I have no idea. I think he swung a huge hammer, something happened and a, a railroad spike went through um, the frontal lobe, the, the, the fore part of his brain. And he was surprisingly not dead. He, was, he, he lived through that. Um, but they noticed a lot of behavioral changes with Phineas he is afterward. He was like quicker to anger. He wasn't super patient. He wasn't as loving and kind. He used to be this like really kind, loving person. And so you can kind of surmise there that that has something to do with some sort of behavior thing. And maybe it's his nice center. And so research through the ages is kind of like taking pieces out or people who have you know different accidents. These lesion studies tell us a little bit about how the brain works. But as you'll see, it's really easy to make a mistake there and say, okay, well, this part of the brain then is for being nice or you'll see those kind of old phrenology maps of like, this is the part of the brain that does this. This is the part of the brain that does this. It's really easy to make a mistake because the brain is a network. It, it, it works together. So lesion studies are one way that we do that. There's also non-invasive ways to do that. I worked in a lab for a couple of years where we use non-invasive uh, brain stimulation, basically kind of powerful magnets that were held over different parts of the brain. And that magnetic pulse incapacitated part of the brain, and then you could kind of research it and see what happens there. So. Lesion studies, non-invasive brain stimulation, that's one way. Uh, the other way that we uh, study the brain is uh, structurally, we can do imaging and we can also do functional imaging. Um, I didn't have these slides last year, but it, it made sense to me to put them this year as we're all kind of staring at the screen, you can see it a little bit better. Um, if you haven't seen an fMRI, this is what it looks like. And that stands for a functional magnetic resonance imaging machine. Um, those, that big, circle there that she's going into. I've, maybe some of you have been in one. I've, I've been in a very powerful one at MIT. I think the most powerful one on earth. Um, and it had, it has a series of magnets around. Um, and, and what it does is all of those magnetic fields uh, cause a reaction in hydrogen atoms and they give off uh, an electromagnetic signal that the, the machine can then read. So using that signal, you can get pictures like this. So you can see the structural elements there, the cranium, uh, the brain. And the really cool part is that um, you can also detect um, differences in blood oxygenation, um, which then tells you how, um, how blood is flowing throughout the brain. 
So that little arrow there says oxygenated blood flow. Um, that's, that's the technology that allows us to see what activates or what lights up, you might have heard it said, um, in different regions of the brain uh, given a certain activity. Now, I, it's important to show you, I'll flip back to here, to see the setup here. This is not a real life setup. So when you're going through and, and getting an image and a reading of the brain, there's limitations research-wise on what you can see is activated. So what they'll do is they'll show people pictures of like a bear, and it's scary. And then they'll, they'll look and they'll see the picture and they go, oh, look, there's some, there's some activity over here in the amygdala. That means that they're, that they're scared, that's a fight or flight response. And that's true that like we can use those things to, to get an approximation there. What's not true though, is that you're not seeing a bear. It, you know, you're seeing a picture of a bear inside a really weird machine and you can't move your head, they have these things. So it, like any, any science that there's an approximation of what you're actually seeing. And so even here, you know, you have to take this with a little bit of grain of salt. There are really elegant ways to research this and, and, um, um, and replicate results that give us a good sense of what's happening in different parts of the brain. So I'm not, not here to discount the research. I'm just saying it's really important to see these methods because it gives you a sense of, okay, we're, we're really doing a copy of a copy of a copy here when we're making these, these applications to education or to business or whatever we're doing um, is a fun fact. And my favorite fact about brain images is that even by showing you a picture of brain images, so you're all presumably looking at this image, um, I gain credibility. <laughs> so they did this study of, if you show someone a picture of a brain in a study, do they, do they believe it more? Do they believe the results more? And to a statistically significant degree, degree they did, they would just, they had this this paper that showed all these results and the brain scan had nothing to do with the rest of the findings. They just put a picture of a brain scan in there and people, again, statistically significant degree said, oh, I really, I really trust these results because again, the brain's a mystery. And so if people see a brain scan and they say there's activity there, oh, it's, it's gotta be true. It's, it's, it's gotta work. And so I, I think early on this, in this, you know, I'm, I'm not going to give you a whole course on brain anatomy and I don't even know all the, the depths of, uh, of, of uh, imaging uh, technology, but I do want to point out that we consume brain information in a very different way. It's very mysterious. We, uh, we want to take some explanations here because it's this very mysterious thing that controls all of what we do, mind, soul, whatever it is in here. Uh, we want to make some assumptions about that. So it can be dangerous. I'm going to pause. Am I still on? Lorena, am I good? Everyone's, everyone's still good? Hanging in here? Okay. Yep. Um, all right. You're good. I feel like when I get to the brain scan part of this, I have to take a breath. Okay, this is another take a breath of slide because this can be a whole course, but um, this idea of neural networks is in stark contrast to this idea of localization of every function in the brain. So I should have put up a picture of that phrenology picture that I keep referring to, but if you can imagine with me, you may have seen this, like this kind of antiquated, like 19th century picture of a brain where it's like the hands, uh, that's not a good example. Um, the mind is here and math is here and you know all these different pieces of the brain are just localized. Um, one of the things that the research has borne out is that that's not at all how it works. Uh, the brain works through networks in different parts of the brain. So me just picking up this pen, me talking, uh, me giving this talk, um, is activating all sorts of different parts of my brain. That's retrieval, it's sensory, it's motor. There's all different parts that are interacting to, to be able to provide this, this behavior. Um, and those pathways are, are formed through experience and trial and error. So I, I, the kids are on my mind all, all day, every day. I have a four-year-old and a one-year-old. So I'm thinking of my little daughter, Ellie, who's just walking and she's testing things out. And she'll look at me when she's, we're having dinner and spaghetti and she'll take her fork and look it over here and she'll read me. She's looking at me knowing that I don't want her to drop that fork. And then she'll do that and then look for the reaction. And she's not naughty. She's, well, a little bit, but she's, she's like looking for my, she's like looking to see what I do. And that's highly interesting to her because she sees a cause and effect. And I don't wanna go through all the developmental psychology of that, but just she is forming a pathway in her brain of these neural connections, these neurons that are forming stronger and stronger connections in the same way that you might form a stronger and stronger pathway on a trail. And this is the best metaphor I can come up with for this, which is as you 
reinforce these pathways as you get a sense of um, not good drop fork, <laughs> whatever that's kind of coded in your brain, that reinforces, that reinforces. And it biologically reinforces. So there's, um, there's a material called myelin. Um, those pathways, uh, a neuron connects to uh, another neuron that gets strengthened through what's called myelination and they come, it becomes kind of a super highway of information. And so as you, as you form these pathways in your brain, they almost become shortcuts. Um, you, you start um, predicting these things that are gonna happen. So Ellie, by now, even after a few times has formed that pathway of her dropping fork and she's gonna predict now, she can actually see in the future kind of, like she can see what's gonna happen when she, she drops that fork. Now, if you know she dropped her fork and I was to do a backflip, that would be a totally novel reaction. She would have no place for that in her head that wouldn't exist for her. And so that predictive model for her brain just totally would break down. And um, a development psychologist early on, very formative and very influential in, in Montessori education, uh, Jean Piaget, he talked about this as assimilation versus accommodation. You know, if there's a, there's a piece of information, a piece of data, piece of feedback that comes in that fits with my worldview, fits with my schema, he called it, then I, I assimilate. It goes down that super highway of a, of a pathway that's already formed. I'm, I'm those hikers on that current path. If something comes in that's totally novel and I don't have a place for it, I have to create a new pathway. Um, and the, the important thing to point out is that just like in this picture, going through that grass and creating a whole new trail is, is kind of a slog. It's kind of a grind. Like you have to go through that. You have to blaze this trail. It's not super easy. It's slower and it's biologically expensive. It takes a lot of glucose to do that. It, 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 your brain has to actually work really hard to do that. And I'm gonna make the point throughout that this is what learning is, is it's not getting through and going on those reinforced pathways as far and as fast as you can get. A lot of education looks like that, um, but it's this ability to create novel pathways um, the kind of social structure around, which includes teachers and administrators to, to be able to support um, kids, especially, but even adult learners, creating those novel pathways, accommodating new information. And so I, I just wanna show out that there's a match between what we do in education that, you know, that, that is the hard work. It is the no pain, no gain type of concept um, and what the brain does. The brain is like physically creating these pathways, creating these neural connections. And when you have to create a new one, it's harder, but then you, you have all sorts of other possibilities after that, right? So I don't know where Ellie dropping the fork drops, <laughs> falls into this now, I've lost that metaphor, but hopefully that got us to the point where you're seeing that we have in, like pathways that develop in the brain and then we have to create new pathways to accommodate new information. Those last two slides are super heavy, by the way. Those, that's, like, that's, that's like intro cog neuroscience. Um, stuff and it takes a long time. Um, okay, so now we'll just shift to child development. Um, I want to talk about how those pathways form in early childhood and how that's different from other other times in your life. We're we're born with the same amount of neurons really that kind of go through um, uh, adulthood. There's there's periods of what's called synaptogenesis and creating new connections and creating new uh, neurons, but um, by and large we have the kind of neural architecture that's there in place. Um, what's different is that those connections and those pathways aren't made yet. And so uh, children will form these pathways, but in kind of adult terms, they're pretty haphazard and pretty random. So if, uh, I don't know, my, my son's four, he will come up with some like really outside ideas that totally fall out of, the, you know, how, how I've been thinking about something because his pathways aren't formed the same way that mine are. And it kind of strikes sometimes as just like odd or ill-fitting or no, we have to put your shoes on now. We're, we're going out the door. I don't know why you would think that this would relate to that, but okay, sure, like I'll go with that. Um, it also strikes us as really uh, innovative and, and exciting and um, putting things together that we would never think to go together. That's because Daniel's and Ellie's and, and all of us, all of our neural pathways are just forming and they take these kind of weird turns sometimes. And um, the feedback that they get informs what they do with that pathway. And so like, if he says, um, it, you know, daddy time to go and I go, okay, time to get your shoes on. And he says, hey, how about we, we play with sticks right now? And my reaction is no, never do that again. In his mind, what's coded is, oh, that's like a very egregious 
that's a very egregious turn. I should never take that turn again. Like that's, there's a lot there, but um, just for the sake of this, this example, he's forming a, a different pathway there than if we talked about doing that collaboratively or what's the difference there or what happens if, or what are the consequences if, he starts to build those connections differently. And so this is over many iterations that these uh, neural networks form, but it's one of the reasons why these kind of seminal moments happen where if something happens that's, that's super important or super traumatic, that, that pathway is really hard to change because it's a very, very clear feedback of the importance of that pathway. So child development, um, there's lots of pathways that are forming. Um, and that's what that word neuroplasticity means. There's lots of different ways that the brain is kind of forming and shaping. And it's especially important in uh, early childhood. I think we all know this intuitively. I imagine everyone on the phone or uh, on the call is, um, is, is, has, has kids at Woodenville Montessori and is kind of experiencing this, but that's what's happening in the brain um, when, when this is happening. Um, the last bit I wanna end on, the, on, this is the last side of the brain basics piece is this idea of neuroscience and education. And again, I just wanna reinforce how little we know about the brain. I don't wanna undercut myself here, but we, we don't know tons. And so to make this, this, this leap to then, this is how we do education or this is how we do it in the classroom is, has been what some researchers call a, a bridge possibly too far, right? Like that's, we take this brain scan and then we go, okay, well math, his math center lights up when we show him this thing and therefore we should do this in math class. I'll show one of the myths, uh, one of the common myths I'll talk about kind of makes that leap. And you have to have sort of an intermediary. You have to have um, sort of some, some sort of like behavioral lens on this. And the, the point I wanna make is that formal education or classroom education is a mix of art and science. So there's gonna be some things that inform what we do with education or some things that um, help us understand what instructional methods are best. Um, but you really need the, the kind of long history and especially relational capital that um, classroom instructors bring to be able to make this all work. So mix of art and science. Okay, I always feel very breathless when I go through the brain basics piece of this because it's heavy. Um, I, I guess if there's a take home, it's that the brain is a black box. Please just know that if you see something that's you know, brain-based, just raise your eyebrow. Uh, but what we do know about how neural networks form, consolidate and adapt, it does give us some insight into the learning process. And again, applications of that are in, flu in flux and uh, shouldn't be taken at face value all the time. Okay, I'm at the common myths section here. I, I'm gonna change it up and say, is there anyone who ha needs to go off mute and just has like a direct question off of that or um, I can also try to trigger this now, and you can see the URL for um, asking questions. I'm just gonna pause like 30 seconds in case anyone wants to ask a quick question. I don't have to, you can save it till the end, but there was just a lot there. If not, that is fine. I'm gonna leave that URL there. And so if something uh, comes up as it does for me, as soon as we move off a different conversation, then my question pops up. So feel free to do that. Okay, so common myths. I uh, am changing the order here uh, from last year. This I address at the end is almost just, let's kind of like fun facts thing. But I do think this ties really well into this idea of how the brain works because it's a lot of misapplications of research. Um, all right. I don't know how to see show of hands. In the room, I would ask if anyone's heard of this, this myth, this 10% myth of we only use 10% of our brain. Um, uh, uh, that's false. So <laughs> a healthy person uses all of his or her brain, not part. I talked about neural networks. So um, a lot of these have come through lesion studies. There's, there's been um, what's called hemispheric lesions. So people whose uh, their, their brains uh, weren't connected uh, by the corpus callosum. There, there's, there's all sorts of different ways that we've kind of gotten at this, but I guess the real question is where did this come from in the first place? Like, why do we even think that 10% of our brain is, is what we use? And the best we can trace it is back to like this turn of the century, um, like 1890s turn of the century, a uh, group of researchers who studied this uh, savant child who was just able to do all these things and said, well, if they're able to do this thing at this age, then by comparison, all the other kids of his age is really like only using 10% of what they could do. And it was this idea of like, there's so much untapped potential. Again, this black box idea. We don't know what's happening in there. So we just assume that, there, that there's lots um, 
to go. Um, yeah, it's it's just not true. We use we use all of our brain, and even people who have lots big parts of their brain incapacitated have been able to reappropriate that neural tissue to to do other things. So we fully use all of our brain. I think the thing I like to show here, I talked about expensive biology. Our brains are efficient. Like we're efficient. <laughs> you know, like our evolutionarily, we wouldn't have come come this far and had like a ninety percent useless thing up here um, just for the sake of it. So. Maybe just that's that's the other angle to to go at this, um, but it's it's pretty hard to unring a bell, and this idea of we only use ten percent of our brain has has persisted. Um, here's here's one you might have heard is I'm a right brain person, or I'm a left brain person, or uh, right brain is is logic and left brain is creativity, or sometimes they're switched. I, I choose not to remember which one which one is which. Um, but this idea of lateralization um, isn't true. There's there's some things. Um, um, that are lateralized. There are some things that are more to do with this side of the brain than the other. So um, the best example of this is, is in language. Uh, Broca and, and Wernicke are these two researchers in uh, the 1800s, again. Um, they discovered like some speech and language processing changes, again, by lesion studies. People who had injuries to the spot weren't able to process information or read. So there are certain areas that are, that are lateralized. But to kind of globalize this idea to say, well, then this side is responsible for all creative action. This side is responsible for all logical action. It's just not true. Um, that just, there's no research to support that. And it's perpetuated by these kind of cultural myths of like a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde of, you know, which part of your brain are you using? Um, again, it's not lateralized. It's not localized. It's networked. That's one of, one of the take home points. Here's one um, that's fun is classical music makes you smarter. And I will get the, like kind of visceral appeal of this. Uh, having kids, you like want to, <laughs> you want to do like everything you can. And so it's like, well, no harm, no foul. I'll just play some Mozart. That's fine. There have been like tons of products that have come up in this whole vein of like, it would be great if, you know, baby Einstein and things like this. They're not like bad, but the claims of like, classical music makes you smarter is, isn't there. And this is based again on, a, on an initial research study that was kind of taken out of context and uh, the results kind of spread in places that they shouldn't go was this, um, they, they, they took a study, they, they played classical music and then kids did better on a, on a test. Um, so it blew up and people were really excited about this. But then they did the same study with pop music and kids did even better. And the idea was like, maybe there's an extraneous factor here where it's not the actual classical music here. It's the fact that kids are maybe more engaged with the material when there's music playing. And even that shouldn't be taken out of context. Please don't quote me there and say, we should just play music when they're doing. There's even other studies that say, well, that then distracts them from what they're doing. So you shouldn't play music. And so this idea of like, what's the optimal music to play? It's just so much more complicated than this does that. It's not a cause and effect. Um, so. Uh, debunked, untrue, that classical music makes you smart. I, I guess I should say that smarter is a really loaded word there. Classical music, there are certain rhythms there, there are certain experiences there um, that have beneficial attributes too. But this idea that it's going to make you better at math, that's not true. Is anyone just feeling hurt now? Like they, they thought the 10% myth, they thought I'm a left brain person and they just played classical music all the time. Well, now we're on Zoom, so I can't see you in person. And uh, I'm sorry about that. Um, all right, why is this not going? Okay, languages have to be learned early. Okay, so kind of, like if we're scoring this like um, political debate fact check, the first three are kind of like just not true, lie your pants on fire. This one is like kinda, this one's like half true. Um, and this is the idea I talked about neuroplasticity, networks forming. There, um, there's this idea of critical periods versus sensitive periods. And this idea of critical periods was this window that just shuts. Like if you haven't learned Spanish by age 12, sorry, like never happening for you. And that's, that's not true. We know that neuroplasticity is ongoing even into adulthood. You may have even heard, I should, I, I should put this one in here of like you're fully formed at 25. Again, not totally true. There's like still tons of stuff happening in your brain and moving around and, and learning new networks. Um, this idea of sensitive periods, though, is that there's a period in your early childhood in which phenomic awareness or like awareness of phenomes and sounds and how words go together is really important and it really carries over into adulthood. So that's why you will see kids who are exposed to languages early have an easier time learning them later. Um, and that that kind of early window of learning languages is true. 
it's also true that you can learn languages later. It's just a little bit of a tougher road. If I can flip back to this, the risk of ruining my application, it just, that becomes a more reinforced pathway the longer you go when you have phonomic awareness early on. And that novel pathway of learning a new language is harder as you go on, but it's not impossible. Okay. Uh, yep. And I think this is the last one. I'm a visual learner, this idea of learning styles. Um, this is a fun one because a lot of people just still believe this. Um, this idea that I am a visual learner, I am a, an auditory learner, I'm a written word learner or a kinesthetic learner. There's even an acronym for that, which usually means it's like official. It's VARC, visual, auditory, reading, and kinesthetic. Um, there have been schools built on this, like whole curriculums built on this. Um, and it's just not supported by the research. I think in fact, in, of all the myths, this is the most kind of studied and attempted to replicate and it, it just doesn't happen. And I think one of the things to point out here is that there's a difference between preference and, and uh, learning efficacy. So this idea of I'm a visual learner at its base, this myth is that I learn better when I see something visualized. Um, but when they did a study and they said, all right, organize yourself into groups, you can pick any of these four, are you visual, auditory, et cetera? And people picked their groups and then they assigned a novel task and people were going through them and trying to, trying to learn these things. Compared to a control group, they learned no differently, no better, no worse. There was no demonstrated effect of this kind of learning style. And um, in fact, in lectures, they did this, this study at Harvard a couple of years ago, in lecture halls, they, they ask people to report, which lecturer do you like? What's the kind of best learning style for you? What's the best, you know, what's the best type of lecture? And they would say, I love this lecture. He clarifies everything. It's, it's perfect. That's so crystal clear. I've learned so much from him uh, compared to another lecture where it was kind of harder, more active learning, they call it, uh, kind of grinded out. And the learning outcomes were actually flipped where the people who actually had the struggle, maybe it wasn't super clear in the lecture, they actually learned a lot more because their brains had to engage a lot more with that. They actually had to create the pathways themselves instead of um, relying on the, uh, the lecturer to do it for them. So um, that touches another idea I'll talk about later, but this idea of I have a learning style, this is my way of doing it, is just not supported by the, uh, the research. Now, it doesn't mean you, you don't have a preference. That's fine. You can have a preference, but just know that it doesn't materialize in better learning outcomes as far as we can measure those. Okay. Um, and I said here, it's, it's misleading for instructional design. I think, I, I think it's erroneous to then take this, to, to take this and build anything on top of that. I think it's maybe a um, fun, interesting angle on this, but don't go too, don't go too crazy with the VARC thing. Okay. All right, I'm checking time. I'm at about a half hour. I wanna um, uh, not go too long. So I'll summarize this section to say, uh, myths about the brain come from overgeneralizations and misapplications of neuroscience research. Again, black box, we want, to, we want to understand it. We don't necessarily understand it. They're mostly harmless, but also unreliable for making decisions around parenting or instructional design. So again, don't, do, don't go too crazy with those. There are, um, I guess I can maybe afterward provide some resources. There are some pretty reliable resources that basically internalize the research that comes out and, and provide good recommendations and what they mean. Um, those are really great to go to. It's almost original source stuff um, instead of waiting till it gets to um, some like pop press thing and then they, they start taking a sensational, sensationalized headline and that's where we get into trouble. Okay, I'm just gonna talk about how we learn. No big deal. Um, this is really what I what I focus on in, in my work is how we uh, how kids learn. Uh, the, there are a few slides here, but um, I hope you know they're important. Um, first, really big paradigm shift thing, at least it was for me, was that we don't receive knowledge, we build it. And there's two ways of looking at this. There's this kind of model of knowledge being transferred into our brains or this empty vessel and they're just pouring knowledge in. I think of like Neo in the Matrix and he's like, gets plugged into his brain and he, now he knows Kung Fu. This idea of like knowledge just being transferred into you is that same idea of assimilation I was talking about. It's just, it just goes along the same kind of track that you already have. Um, but the mistake we make in education or a lot of um, institutions of education make is that knowledge would just be transferred to you. You have a teacher who knows a lot, you have students who don't know, and they're just gonna like over the course of a semester pour this into your brain. The model that is far more accurate for, for uh, building effective learning outcomes is this constructivist model. The idea that we build schemas, we build 
and accommodate and, and, and uh, create new schemas for information, which is this idea of construction and you are building it. And I think that fundamentally changes the posture of the instructor in a way that's very, I hope you see tied into the Montessori method. Um, there's this idea, so here's a quote from, from Maria Montessori. Um, I'll just read it. Here is an essential principle of education. To teach details is to bring confusion. To establish the relationship between things is to bring knowledge. Now, yes, it's okay to teach details. That's, that's fine. I, just, just hear the kind of essence or the spirit of what this, what this quote is saying, which is if we're just trying to pour, uh, yeah, pour, pour details into uh, to, to a kid's brain and just say, you need to know more. I'm just putting stuff in. I don't care about where you're coming from or what you're approaching the subject with or what you've already established or how you see the world. I'm just gonna put information in. Um, that glass is gonna overflow slash spill slash go elsewhere. It's just not gonna work. Uh, you might get a little bit there, but it's not really gonna work. Construction, constructivism says that we are, kids are actively building knowledge. They're actually, actually actively creating these schemas and relationships between things. And once those vessels are built, then you can assimilate and bring information in. Um, but it has to be led by the student, has to be led by um, the learner. So that's a fundamentally different way of thinking about education. It's not just poured in, it's not transferred, it's um, constructed. Again, there's room for transfer and, and adding details and those things, but those are the things that by and large we already know, we're just adding more things to. Um, what, what, what interests me in, especially early childhood education is we are forming new relationships between things and helping kids to, to kind of understand those things. Um, a re another really important uh, point about uh, learning and how the brain works is that progress is dynamic, that skill development uh, isn't a straight line. You don't just get better and better and better and better and better at math, it goes up and down. And that can often be frustrating. Um, it can often be you know, discouraging. You just knew that last year, or you just pluralized that word um, last week or whatever it is. It, it will feel like we want progress to go up and up and up. I, I will admit to even feeling that, I just like have that assumption in my brain that there's been so much built into me over my lifetime that you just, you don't go backwards. You know, you always, you always go up. Um, but it's really important to know that how our brain works, especially if we're saying we're forming new neural networks we're building this way, we're getting feedback, oh, we're gonna have to go backtrack and build another new novel pathway. That in itself is, is uh, one step forward, two steps back uh, sometimes. And so you have to kind of accommodate that in your educational outcomes and in your parenting. Um, you have to think about that, that progress is dynamic. Um, that, that by the way is a, a Kurt Fisher concept called dynamic skill theory. Um, this is a uh, Howard Gardner concept called multiple intelligence theory. Um, which if you haven't heard of, this is another mind blowing thing, which is that we don't have just this IQ. It was this theory early on that it's not just smart and not, or smart and different levels of smart, that there's lots of different types of intelligence. Um, that someone might be um, very uh, uh, logical, uh, analytical and intelligent. There might be someone who's, I guess you'd call that like math. Um, and then there's someone who's very good at uh, writing, uh, reading, understanding language. And so one of the things that educators had done uh, previously and, and people who still kind of do this is write me an essay, write me an essay on how you feel about the French Revolution or whatever it is. And across a span of 30 kids in one classroom, let's call it a high school classroom, you might have some kids who, who really don't have that type of intelligence. That's, that's, not their, that's not their strong suit, but they really might know they might, might, might have a great sense of historical intelligence. They might have a great understanding of the relationships between events, how to map that onto today, how to see some of the same patterns. And so a teacher might assign that, get an essay back that's you know, grammatically incorrect. There's all sorts of different phrasings. It's, it's, it, it doesn't really stick together and say, F minus, you don't understand the, the French Revolution. I'm sorry, and like that, that's your report. And the feedback there, again, if we're talking about feedback and loops, is that, that student doesn't really know. They just go and they go, oh, I am really bad at history then, this is awful. And what we've done there is conflated these different types of intelligence. So if there are ways for that teacher to access that type of historical intelligence in that student and say, hey, in, in whatever way makes sense for you, or here are three options of ways that you can represent this, describe to me the, the importance of the French Revolution or what that might look like. And someone might take different, um, uh, they, might, they might draw that out. Um, they might show in a, in a graphical form how, how the different events relate. 
or they might act that out. They might they might show over the series of a, of a narrative how the French Revolution has has impacted today. Um, in any of those, they might get an A plus, but um, because they had to write an essay, they might get an F. And so this is this is different than learning styles. I want to point out that it's not just saying this is a preference in the way that I understand information. It's it's in the way that you your mind works and the way that your brain works. Um, you have people have different um, different uh, strengths that map onto these different types of intelligences. This is again a placeholder slide for a big swath of of research and data, but um, this is really important to know um, because I, I think it helps us appreciate the diversity of learning. Uh, and our learners, and not just say, well, they're smart kids and not smart kids, and, and just take it or leave it. Um, again, I always push back on this idea of IQ. You know, I have a high IQ, well, in what? And usually that's spatial reasoning or spatial logical reasoning. Okay, um, this, is, this is a little shout out to 2020. Online learning uh, is limited. Um, this is kind of an of course, but it's worth saying that online instruction is kind of just a piece. Uh, it's not the whole puzzle. Um, if we have time, I can go through a framework that really shows how this is limited. But in short, um, I, I don't want to say that online learning is just uniformly bad. I think what it does is actually it disproportionately promotes some things in the learning process for the brain um, that, that that just off balance. So one of the things that online learning is great for is different giving different uh, ways for students to access information. So a lot more students. Uh, you might have even read some articles about students saying, I actually love learning online. This is really easy. Well, a lot of times those students had, had really trouble accessing information. They were back in the class, they couldn't see. They were really distracted by all the behavioral issues in class and they couldn't really get a sense of what the teacher was saying. Um, they wanted to engage, but they really couldn't. All of those kind of representational issues were, were really problematic in the classroom learning, but now they're online and they can actually have access to it at any time. They can stop, press play, they can uh, press pause, press play. They can do all sorts of things. So that that uh, kind of um, that that category of representational factors is way up in online learning. That's great. What's down is the kind of um, the kind of why we we are learning. It's really hard to set context and importance and engagement there, um, and it's really hard for kids to strategize in that in that space. So there's a lot of executive function limitations in online learning. So again, I can, uh, that's, that's called the UDL framework. I can go through that a little bit, but um, online learning just is limited. It's, it's a little bit off balance. I think one of the really cool things going forward is how everyone's been introduced to online learning now. There are gonna be some places where it's actually useful. Um, there are gonna be places where I think we're gonna incorporate that into our learning. Um, I hate to say the word efficient, but um, it might make our classroom instruction a little bit more efficient or spending some time on the things that are suitable for online learning and then reserving that classroom time and kind of a flipped classroom model. Um, Stanford started that and they, they've done a really good job in, in the medical school doing that. So it's just limited, it's not balanced. So it, it really needs to be part of a, whole, a holistic picture of learning. I went through that um, more breathlessly than I thought, um, even, the, even the brain basics piece. So apologize, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I do wanna get to this healthy brains piece and I, I'm gonna do a time check here too. Yeah, we're close. So I'm gonna get to healthy brains. Um, this is, this is kind of more straightforward and this is more recommendy, um, not as kind of like researchy. Um, this is a phrase I love uh, from one of our, Jen and my uh, old mentors, uh, Amy Weinberg. So oh, she, she would always say action is oxygen. And she meant it in the context of like, go do something. And then it kind of promotes other things and, and propagates other things. I mean, it is like literal physical action, exercise and play are super, super important. There's a, there's a researcher, um, Dan Wolpert, um, I think he's out of Virginia, who, who says like the brain, uh, his whole theory in this whole book is about the brain is built for movement. Uh, there are like examples in nature of animals um, who no longer had to move. I think it's a sea cucumber and they planted themselves on a rock. And because they didn't really have to move anymore, they actually consumed their brain. They they like they they evol <laughs> they they evolved out of having to need a brain. And this is the, this idea of our brains are made to move. And so if you look at the converse of that, what happens when we don't move? Well, yeah, we can still we can still learn. We can still get things into our brain. We can still make these associations because we're amazing at abstraction. But our bodies just aren't really built for it. Our bodies are made to move. Our bodies are made to regulate stress based on movement. Uh, one of the really interesting things is as uh, exercise primes us for learning. So 
um, it's, it's a theory. There's no way to really prove this, but there's this idea that um, our, our ancestors were always on the move. We're nomadic, we're moving around. And this idea that as we're moving, we're having to take in different parts of the landscape and know where different things are, um, being, able, being able to memorize those things, uh, code those into memory, um, that all happened when we're moving. And so movement still kind of like primally um, gets us ready to start taking information, knowing that it's important. There's, there's a really big biological signal that says, hey, when you're moving, things are more important. And your brain is, if anything, a what, what matters machine, right? It's always coding and figuring out and building networks on, does this matter? No, nah, this doesn't matter. If that doesn't matter, we're going to cut it out. You know, so your brain's, again, hyper-efficient. Um, it's just really important to point out that uh, exercise regulates stress as well. And um, this is, oh, um, the book's called How Children Succeed, but there's a, there's a, there's a book that talks about just the, the, there's lots of books, but the one I'm thinking of talks about the, what the effect of stress is on learning and how it creates this fight or flight, um, saber tooth tiger type response where if you had elevated stress levels, nothing's coming in. All you're trying to do is survive. And a lot of kids, uh, unfortunately, live in a chronic state of stress, um, either by food insecurity or literal physical uh, safety issues. And so um, good luck getting any sort of educational outcomes out of that situation where stress is so high. Um, but again, um, exercise helps combat that. So I put that as the first slide because it is, for me, like super, super, super important. Action, um, exercise is super important. Struggling is okay. I think this is just a little bit of like a, it's all right if kids are struggling. Um, clearly, like it's, it's so much easier when, when kids are like, I got this right away, it's, it's no problem. But struggling is part of learning. I hope I demonstrated that with the kind of neural networks uh, framing of it's really hard to build something new. It's really hard to construct a new schema. And so struggling with that is not only okay, it's expected. We have to kind of accommodate that. Um, I think I've already talked enough about that. Um, boredom is beneficial. This idea that mind wandering or kind of daydreaming, it's not just someone being off task. It's super critical for our brains to kind of make these connections, these kind of loose random connections that build the network very strong and robust. Um, I guess the opposite would be super attentive all the time, task at hand, no room for mind wandering. You might get a really robust super highway in your neural network, but you wouldn't get a very, um, a, a very diverse one and well-supported one. Boredom, sleep, all of these kind of uh, consolidation uh, effects in your brain is super important for, for kids. And so, um, you know, uh, don't take it to the extreme where like kids have no, no activation of whatever they're doing. But I, I cringe at, a little bit at the, uh, the feeling, especially um, in like well-meaning parents who just like want their kids to be active, focused, learning all the time, all the time. Even when they're picking their nose, looking off into the distance, they're learning. This is part of the learning process. Um, and it's really important for both uh, creativity, these kind of random connections, but also executive function, which I could just, that's, that's the area that I focus on is, is it executive function. It is, um, it's inhibitory behavior, it's planning behavior, it's strategy behavior. All of that is super important as they grow older. So don't be afraid of boredom. It's all right. Um, preaching to the converted here. Screen time is junk food. We're all staring at a screen, but um, you know, I imagine that we all try and limit screen use um, in our households. Um, if struggling isn't bad, I just said that a few slides ago, and boredom is sometimes good. Screen time is kind of the worst of both, right? It's it, a lot of the activities on screens are just, they're like, they're like candy. It's super easy for you to get into that, to be entertained by it. The reward centers of your brain are going nuts. It's kind of like slot machines. Uh, again, not all screens are the same. So I'm just talking about like these games or these, these really interactive type of things on screens. Um, and you're not allowed to get bored. You're not allowed to wander. It keeps on pulling you in. And so it's not restful. Um, it's, it's engaging kind of this way. Uh, one researcher I, I read said it's impoverished stimulation. And they, the comparison there was like, it's, it's like working out your arms all the time, but none of the rest of your body. You just have this kind of unbalanced activation of, of your brain. And it's just not how we were made to do it. Um, the junk food comparison is, is apt for me because that just means it's, it's fine every once in a while. No, McDonald's isn't going to kill you. Um, but uh, if that's all your diet consists of, if that's all you're trying to do, um, it's really unhealthy. And I think the other part is it's kind of like, it's not just... Um, 
it, it's the opportunity cost too. You're, you're not getting good healthy activities in that space too. So that's, that's kind of a double whammy. Um, I guess the recommendation there, one of the big ones is no screen time before bed. Um, that, that blue light really helps disrupt the sleep and sleep is super important for, uh, for your brains as well um, as a healthy diet. But those themes seem kind of, uh, kind of um, apparent on the surface. Um, and if uh, screen time is, is uh, junk food, then socializing is, is a good healthy salad. Um, and this is the part where we kind of pour one out for 2020 because socializing was the thing that was taken away from all of us so much where we couldn't have live real social interactions. We're doing this thing on Zoom, we're trying our best, we have to, um, but it's not the same. And I think in the same way that exercise kind of triggers so much of these biological functions for our brain to kind of you know, take notice and, and start to learn, socializing is, is what we're built for. We've got regions in the brain. I know I said uh, brain functions aren't, aren't hyper-localized, but there are certain parts of the brain that are focused specifically for recognizing people's faces specifically for recognizing people's faces. There's this disorder called prosopagnosia where if that part is cut out or injured or whatever it is, people can't recognize faces. They can recognize voices, they can recognize hands, they can recognize clothes. When it comes to faces, nothing. So we actually have like, we are highly attuned to people's faces. And so when not only are you not able to get together and have these interactions, which I've called the ultimate brain test because it's just like all the learning, all the conversing, all that stuff, that is like the ultimate test is being with other people and seeing how things play out. We're, we're so attuned to that. Um, it's also tough because we're not able to do that, but then we also have masks and we can't read facial expressions and body language and all that stuff. So I, I think there's nothing else to say here other than this is tough and I can't wait to get back to more socializing. Clearly we um, need to prioritize the, the public health measures of, of eradicating the pandemic, but um, this is the thing that's that's, uh, such a tough loss for 2020, and we will get back there soon. Um, here's my summary slide. This is this is very much what I said last year. I, I changed a few of the the words, but um, all of that, the kind of how we learn and brain health. The summary for me um, there is the research suggests that learning is constructed, not delivered. Again, not poured into a glass, but it's actually built up. Uh, as a result a brain-based education or something that kind of takes from the research and puts into practice should be inclusive of multiple intelligences. It's not just one way of, of being smart. Um, welcoming of resistance, you kind of got to expect it. You got to expect that there's going to be struggle. Gracious to wavering performance, it's going to go up and down. Um, physical and active, I can't emphasize that enough. And I think we all appreciate that uh, you want education to be free, to wander and explore and kind of be self-directed uh, to a certain extent. That's um, I think that's why it's such a good fit with uh, the Montessori um, method and why I try and rope some of those things in here is, is a lot of what we do, it's not like Maria Montessori was sitting there looking at uh, fMRI scans and saying, this is what we should do. A lot of that was just feel and art, but a lot of those kind of principles of what is evolved in the Montessori classroom really do reflect this. I don't see a lot of dissonance there. Um, they're just phrased differently. So hopefully this gives you like some reassurance that Montessori method is, is like going according to this uh, very well. And um, that's where I see, you know, putting our kids here and, and really appreciating that. But also um, that there are some kind of specific takeaways for learning at home, because it doesn't just stop in the classroom. All of these things should be should be thought of at home. Uh, thanks to Laureen and Emily for facilitating this and uh, people at WMS for getting this going again. I didn't leave a lot of questions after six for questions, but I am happy to stay on for a little while if people have them. Thank you, Sean. That was amazing. Um, there, it look, looks like there are some questions in both the chat and ah. the form. Yeah, I can see. Okay. Um, I saw, love to hear your opinion of nutrition and brain development. I, uh, I purposely didn't put a slide there because I asked my wife, my wife's a pediatric dentist. I was like, how yeah, should I talk about nutrition? She's like, there's a whole thing there. <laughs> but um, the the best I've read is that a Mediterranean like plant-based diet with kind of these omega fat acids are, are really important for kind of support for brain activity. Um, there's no magic pill clearly, but um, that is, that's what I read was that a, a Mediterranean diet is not only good for heart health, but good brain health. But I, I can't speak authoritatively on that. Um, sorry, I'm gonna go quickly through that. Um, go off mute if you're like, no, that's not what I meant. 
Um, let's see, there's a question. Is there a brain age where the ship has sailed when developing basic executive functions? Um, that gets back to the critical period versus sensitive period. Um, not that I know of, I'll say, so the executive functions are the latest to develop. Um, that's, that's, um, that's the whole idea of like you're fully formed at 25. Those are the kinds of brain areas that develop latest. Um, what happens in even people they've said in their 80s have restructured their frontal lobes in, in, in certain ways. They just have more efficient processing, especially when it comes to things like these kind of esoteric things of like wisdom and how people access knowledge and these philosophical ideas. So no, I guess is the short answer. There's no age at which the ship has sailed for advanced executive functions. You said basic executive functions. Um, I'm gonna plead the fifth on that. I don't know about basic ones. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I just don't know. Um, it's hard to study that, I would, I'll say. That there's, there's a hard, you'd have to have someone who's like not been exposed to any sort of stimulation. That's hard to do. Uh, relationship between screen time and ADD disorders. Um, there is a connection. It's not a causation, there's a correlation. Um, I will, I'll refer to, let me see, I have these in some of the appendices. Um, let me get into the speaking notes here, hold on. I can actually just send some of these notes afterward, um, but there is a really good resource for the uh, ongoing research in uh, kids' brains um, and ADD and screen time uh, that I can, I can send out. Um, how am I doing? My, I think my headphone went out. Hold on a second. We can hear you fine. You're right. Okay, yeah. great. Uh, what kinds of breaks support brain development aside from sleep, adults and kids? Exercise is the most important one. I may have, um, you may have asked that before I got there. Exercise is super, super important. Uh, sleep is just super important. You already said that adults and kids. Um, I think uh, and, and I guess I would throw in there like different social activities. Uh, again, pour one out, it's tough, but those are the things, exercise, sleep, uh, nutrition, and uh, socialization. Those are the things that are best to do. Could you please repeat the name of the person who developed the progress, oh, dynamic skill theory. That's Kurt Fisher. He was the, he was actually the head of my program and passed away last year, um, the late Kurt Fisher. Uh, dynamic skill theory. And that I can show you as one of my appendices this is his work, this idea that you don't just go up, you go down sometimes too. And you have to kind of build out to different levels of abstractions of a concept. You have to go up and then go down a little bit. And, um, and you see that in, in people developing skills. Um, what kind of parenting tricks do you do with your kiddos to support them in their development? I'm just shocked at how uh, it's, a, it's a do as I say, not as I do some things sometimes where I will catch myself doing a thing just out of instinct because it just feels like there's some sort of this whole control thing or something. And then having to remind myself, wow, this is, this is like a clear, clear, like application of that research. I think the biggest thing is like on task type of things. Like I'll ask Dan to stay, to do a thing and then he'll get distracted by a thing or move around somewhere. It's, it's really hard for me to keep in mind that he's still forming some of these connections and these concepts and to let him explore in a way that's outside of my purview. It's outside of even the like real estate that I've allowed him to do. <laughs> I have to allow more room for that. So that's a reminder for me is um, when he's making these different connections, I want him to kind of go all over the place and not be so tied to sticking on task, doing the thing, seeing it through. I think there's a very long tradition of saying that that builds character, it builds resilience, it builds toughness. But actually what we see is that kids who are able to kind of form those uh, associations themselves, uh, that's a really important exercise for them to do. So yes, stay on task sometimes, but not absolutely all the time. Um, a little bit more depth about how boredom support executive function skills specifically. That's great. I have a paper that can show you that. Um, but essentially, when you don't allow for boredom or time off or mind wandering, um, your, your brain, if you think about it as a muscle, doesn't get to practice the skill of what am I gonna do next? Which is a really important executive function strategic skill. That idea of, okay, it's up to me. I have to choose, I have to get up from my seat, I have to do this, I have to initiate these actions. All of those are executive function skills. 
And when you don't have enough time built in for boredom or mind wandering, is like the official term, um, you don't get to practice that. And so it becomes a very underdeveloped muscle to further and further and further uh, down the line, um, you that kind of atrophies and you get this sense of like, like I've never been bored. I've never kind of had to decide what to do. Help, I don't know what to do. Someone help me, someone put something in front of me. And you'll see this in, I, I work with, you know, I've worked with people too, of some employees of mine who were, it's like, tell me what to do next. And a lot of that is executive function skills where it's like, think about what to do next. And um, that comes from not just boredom, but um, boredom uh, helps contribute to that mind wonder and contributes to that. Um, here's the last one I see. Um, thanks for presentation. I, I realized there was a lot of information packed into yes. And I was a little unclear on the distinction between learning styles and the, uh, the multiple intelligences. Um, oh, interesting. Underlying idea from Montessori. Yeah, um, I, I don't know that I've been able to articulate it super well other than learning styles to me is, um, it's, it's a way of saying learning preferences. Like I prefer to do it this way. I prefer to internalize or take in information this way. And that's what I'm calling out as false is that we all use all of our senses to do the things. And so we might prefer to see something on the board or hear it in a podcast or whatever it is, or, oh, I found this great trick. But that's really misleading because a lot of times what we feel is best is not actually best for our learning. So that's that's the learning styles idea is that it's it's almost like don't trust don't trust yourself sometimes when you think that was super easy. I love that. We often conflate ease and learning efficacy. I heard that super crystal clear. This is great. In fact, maybe even on the presentation, you're like, oh, I, I totally understood that um, that slide. But maybe the result after this, if you were to teach this to someone else, you go, actually, they really didn't get that much from that slide. I'm trying to teach it now. I didn't really understand it. Um, there's a there's a distance there of learning preference and then learning efficacy. Uh, Gardner's stuff about uh, multiple intelligences is around the idea that when we talk about proficiency, um, that we should use different lenses to look at that and not just one discipline. Uh, he has a book called The Discipline Mind. Uh, it, it's this idea that it's not just one space where you're either good or bad. And so like, if you've ever taken an IQ test or I've taken all sorts of like, GMAT or uh, GRE or whatever it is, it'll test your knowledge in this thing through a very specific means. And a lot of times the people who are really good at that have a certain type of intelligence. And so it'll over index how good they are, or how smart they are about a certain thing. And then we kind of take steps and say, okay, they're really good at math. When really there's there's some breakdown into how they've they've um, the way that their mind constructs those the, builds those concepts again builds those skills um, is done in a in a in a certain fashion. So um, yeah, if if you look at the seven intelligence, I've seen it as nine. There's I'm sure there's others, but. Um, I, I, I think the best example I can give was that essay example of you can you can miss someone's intelligence um, by trying to apply um, trying to extract from them a way of representing that that's not their that's not, not their best. So I think one's maybe more sensory and the other one's more expression, uh, if, if that makes sense. Um, now that I'm going through it though, it's it's really hard to distinguish. I'll see if I can provide a resource that's a little better. That's all the questions I got. Um, and I know we went over, but are there any others? Um, even people off mute, I'd be happy to take them. I saw just one more come through. Um, it says, how do I know when my child's brain is wondering and learning when he or she should be doing homework or when they are purposefully distracting themselves? <laughs> yeah, this gets into the like, how do you do as a parent? I don't know, I'm figuring that out. Um, do I know when they are actually wondering and learning? I, I don't know that you do. And I think that's what that's one of the tough things is like, I you have to kind of build the kind of certain environment for the kids to then have different learning outcomes and then trust that they're gonna go through it in certain ways. I think the best way to do that would be to build in time where there's relief, where there's, there's time to get bored. Um, so, as far as keeping them on task, I don't have older kids now. I don't know that challenge, but um, there is a there is a part there is a point at which it is just getting off task and not wanting to do it. And there's maybe more motivational type of um, concerns there, or um, 
like it's just hard to be interested in the topic where they need a break. Um, but I think the overall point of the boredom thing is like, if someone is wandering through uh, a subject or, or having a tough time or um, let's say going off topic a little bit to allow that detour just a bit, I think just to allow no space for that is, is uh, a really hard ask just for intention, but also um, it's really hard to just keep on that task. Um, allowing a little bit of space, maybe in even asking them how they want to uh, explore that space or do they want to break uh, is really important. I'm sorry, that felt like a little bit of a non-answer just because I don't have that, that kind of personal experience. <laughs> that sounds hard. I think we will get there soon. That was great. Okay. Any last questions before we wrap up? Okay. Well, thank you so much, Sean. It was great to hear from you and learn from you. I think we all as adults took some really valuable points away from this tonight um, and hearing it for the second year in a row too, definitely. Um, but thanks everyone for being here. Um, hope to see you soon. You know, we'll send out the recording after this and, and Sean's slides as well. Yeah, thank you folks. Have a good evening. All right, good night.